Um, in the scripture reading tonight, we heard these words. When the angels had left them, that's the shepherds, and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary, and Joseph, and the baby who was lying in the manger. Let's pray together. Father, we come to another Christmas celebration, and Lord, what could keep us from you? You've come to us in Christ, and yet, Lord, we can feel a distance. We can stay away. We can feel that somehow you wouldn't receive us when you've come to us in human flesh. And so I pray tonight, Lord, we might understand why Jesus came, and Lord, how Christmas and the coming of Jesus has changed our world. Reveal yourself to us, Lord. We need to see your glory. Uh, we need to know who you are. And, and Father, invite us to come to you once again tonight as we see Jesus. And we pray together in his name, amen. Now you just think about tonight and the coming of God into the world. Really? Come on, a baby? Just a tiny little baby? This is God's way of changing our world? I remember when our third child was born, we had three, and when our youngest was born, we used a midwife, but we were in the hospital, and at some point in the birthing process, I'm in there, right, I'm coaching, I'm doing my part, and the midwife looks over to me, and she simply said, hey, don't worry, don't worry, come on over here, it's, it's not sterile, come and help, and she wanted me to finish that moment of delivering our baby, to, and, and I did. And afterwards, I mean, this is an amazing experience, right? You become aware of it had been five, over five and a half years since the child before had been born. And wow, these babies are tiny. Look at, this is our son, uh, Nathan. You can see him a couple of days after that. Now, this year, we have been at Granada studying the geography of grace. That is the places associated with the birth of Jesus so that we could understand what God is doing in sending his son into our world. Jerusalem and Bethlehem, Nazareth, and even Egypt. And tonight, we are invited to go with the shepherds to see the manger where Jesus is. And we find ourselves doing, call, being called to do what Mary did when Jesus was born. Did you hear those words? But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. What is God doing? What is happening in this moment? That's what I want to do with you. Ponder and, and treasure these moments that we might take Jesus into our lives. Now, it amazes me that when God sent his son into the world, the shepherds, they weren't invited to the throne room of a mighty king. They were directed to a peasant couple actually in a stable, and when they find Jesus, he's lying in a feeding trough used for animals. And you say, well, why did God choose to enter our world in this way? Well, first, I think all of his purpose is to invite us in to himself. You see, God has an immense problem in relating to us, and it's really his immensity. It's his power. God fills the vast universe Listen to the prophet Isaiah. He said this, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. Surely the nations, they're like a drop in a bucket to him. They are regarded as dust on the scales. And so this is almighty God. This is who he is. How dare we approach him? I remember years ago reading that when Richard Nixon was in the White House, I remember he was elected to office when I was in, in elementary school. But I remember when, he, he, I heard when he was in office, if somebody in the White House started to criticize him and he heard about this, you know what he did? He invited them to come and visit him in the Oval Office. And by the way, this is the seat of the location of the greatest power at least earthly power, right, in our world. And what would happen, it was said, that person who was criticizing, as soon as they came in and saw him, they would fall silent. The criticism would, would drift away and be gone. You see, it's power, but that's not God's power. You see, God does actually the opposite of this. God reveals his power in weakness. 
And it is true, he holds all power in himself, but this is the way God works. I love this scene. When, when God meets the prophet uh, Elijah, and Elijah's depressed and discouraged, this is what we're told. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, a still small voice. Why did God do this? Because, you see, he was drawing near to Elijah, and he's drawing near to us. He wants us to learn the nature of his love. He wants us to know him. And this is why Jesus came, to reveal the Father to us. You see, in Jesus, we learn the compassion of God. We, we learn the love of our Heavenly Father. We learn how patient he is with us. Recently, I was um, in the fellowship hall here at Granada. It was during one of those World Cup matches, and, you know, a few people would gather over there, just break away from work to watch one of the afternoon matches. And as I go into the fellowship hall, um, Evelio Vilches, who is our family ministry pastor, was walking through the fellowship hall, and he was holding his daughter she's about one year old her name is sienna grace and as she walked in the door like my heart almost fell out of my chest right you know why she just reached out her arms to me and it was saying to me would you hold me <laughs> would you take me in your arms and i mean how could i say no of course i took her into my arms you'll see me holding her and the reality is this is what god is doing in jesus He's saying, in him, it's, it's safe to come to me. In him, you're invited into my presence. In him, you can see that I've always wanted fellowship with you. He is reaching out to us. You see, he's not intimidating us from on high. He's doing exactly the opposite. And at Christmas, we realize this. The God that we've always felt like we would have to look up into the heavens to see, we look down and we see the face of a child. It's the Son of God, it's Jesus. And this is what Jesus actually teaches about himself. This is what he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Isn't that beautiful, he's, he's gentle. He's humble in heart. In other words, those, that's the way you could be most inviting to us. And you see, the, the posture that is natural to Jesus is not a pointing finger, but it's literally, it's open arms of welcome. And this is what we see when we go to the manger. The Lord is inviting you to come to him and to receive his rest, to come for rest. Do you know that in Jesus, God is drawing near to you? Now, maybe you felt God is far away. Maybe you think that perhaps if there is a God, he wouldn't be interested in you. You feel such distance between you and God. But I believe we've misunderstood God. Yes, God is transcendent. He's, he's all-powerful, sovereign, but also he's, he's loving and he's present. You know, the story is told of uh, a Native American tribe here in the United States. And what they would do every year when the group of boys were old enough to become men, they would train them to be braves. I mean, how do you go from boyhood to manhood? And there would be a lot of training and teaching by the older men in the tribe. And the rite of passage all came to a head in one night when that boy would be taken out into the wilderness. He was only nine years old at the time, and he would be left outside in the wilderness by himself. And when the sun went down, he could hear the frightful sign, sounds of animals all around him. And he wondered if he would be attacked, but he couldn't. Literally, it's pitch black. He couldn't see a thing. He was terrified and hardly slept, feeling vulnerable. But here's the thing, the next morning when he wakes up, he looks around him and he sees just a few feet away, all of the men of his tribe who have trained him have been sleeping just a few feet from him. He didn't know they were there. And you know who's the closest to him? It's his own father who is there. 
And I think, you see, we think we're alone in the world and we have to face all of this ourselves and God shows us, no, he's, he's present. He's closer to us than anyone else. He's never left you alone. He's been present in your life and everything you've been through. And here in Jesus, he's showing us how he's drawn near. He's invited us to come to him. And he reaches out with his arms, just like that little baby reached out her arms to me. The question is, Will we receive him? In the New Testament, we read this. To all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God, just receive him. Believe in his name. Now, I want to stay with Mary. How could she not be pondering the fact? Because she's had an angel to visit her, and she's been told that, that God would visit her. That's how this baby would be born. How could she not be pondering the fact that Almighty God has come in human form, so small? I think we think about maybe God is interested in the big things, or he, he only works in the big things. But we learn in Jesus that he works through every thing, every small thing too. We might look at the manger, one tiny, tiny baby from among the poor in a downtrodden country at a dark time in their history. And it's like, well, how, how could one person make any kind of difference in the world? We feel that ourselves. How could that happen? But if you notice how small things can end up being the big thing, the thing that changes everything, I don't know, years ago I was reading this story of the Titanic. It's one of the most famous stories from the 20th century, the sinking of that amazing, amazing ship. And do you know that it was likely one very small thing, not the big iceberg that sunk that ship? This guy, Frederick Fleet, at the time when the ship hit the iceberg, was up in the crow's nest and he was the lookout. And one of the things you may not realize about him, however, is that the, the iceberg struck that ship, and by the way, you'll see a picture of it taken the next day. This is the iceberg the ship hit. Do you know the disadvantage that he had? He didn't have the key to the locker on board the Titanic where the binoculars were stored. That night, he was up in the lookout, and he was without the binoculars. I wish I was making that up. Just one small thing. Just a few moments sooner might the ship have been able to steer away. One small thing. And that's what we heard in um, our Advent reading tonight from the Swindolls. Right? The prophet uh, uh, Zechariah says, Who dares despise the day of small things? Who dares despise this? I mean, we, we look at Jesus, we think, this is one person entering into our world. I remember reading about the domino effect. You can picture it in your mind, right? As one domino hits another domino and within a few seconds, maybe a hundred dominoes have knocked down. In 1983, a physicist named Lorne Whitehead put a new spin on the domino effect. Maybe you've heard about this. I don't know if you know this, but one domino is capable of knocking down a domino that's one, that, that's one and a half times its size. And so that means a two-inch domino can knock down a three-inch domino that can then knock down a four-and-a-half-inch domino. You get the idea. But you know, by the time you would reach the 18th domino, it would be large enough to knock over the leaning tower of Pisa. Just 18 of them. The 23rd domino will knock down the Eiffel Tower. And the 31st domino is big enough to, to knock down Mount Everest. Do you see how things can begin with a very small thing? You see, one tiny baby brings just a few disciples along with him into fellowship with God. Jesus has only a few more followers when he rose from the dead, a little over 100. In the year 100 AD, there were only about 25,000 followers of Jesus in the world. But within 200 years, there were over 20 million followers. One domino, right? One small thing, Jesus coming into the world. And today, there are over 1 billion followers of Jesus 
on earth. And this is the way God's grace has grown in our world. This is God's way of changing the world. And what I didn't tell you is this. God made you one of those dominoes. You're a part of that work of sharing the gospel in Christ. You may feel insignificant in the world, but God is also at work in you to expand the reach of his love. So do not despise the day of small things. And finally, what I see when I look at the manger is I not only see how God uses small things, but I also see God's grace. Here's the announcement of the heavenly host to the shepherds that night. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Yes, God's favor, it's the same, it's grace, it's gift love. We don't achieve this, we can only receive it by faith. You know, God didn't have to enter into our world to put on human flesh. This itself was immense sacrifice for the the God of the universe to make himself vulnerable. The one who created all things needed to have everything done for him. You know that the first night when Jesus was born, he couldn't even lift up his own head. God placed his son into the hands, as we've said, of a poor peasant couple. And why did God do this? Because he, he loves humankind, he loves you. God did this to bring peace. I know years ago I read the story of this couple, that's Don and Carol Richardson, and they were called to be missionaries to uh, New Guinea. And when they went there, they went among a very difficult people called the Sawi people. And among these people, they were super treacherous. They regularly would organize raids to villages near them and kill others that lived around them. And when Don shared the gospel, he shared the story about Jesus, when he got to the place of Judas betraying Jesus, they thought Judas was the hero of the story. They thought he was the one they were to emulate because this was their lives. And as their killing continued, Don told the people, he said, if this is the way you're gonna live, I I can't live here with my family. He told them he would leave. And the day after he did this, he woke up to find them in the midst of a very strange ceremony, something super unusual. The leader of their village took his only child, his son, And against the protests of his wife, who at one point reached out and grabbed her son to take him back, he took his son to a neighboring village that they had been warring with. And he announced his desire for them to have peace, saying that that his son would grow up in a family in this rival village where there had been killings between them. And the leader of that village, as a result, took that boy and he called out. He said, it is enough. I will surely plead peace between us because you've given us your son. Those who accept this child as a basis for peace come and lay hands on him. And and Don watched as the members of this tribe, they all walked along and they placed their hand on this child as if to, to welcome him. Then the leader of that village, he went and got a child from his own village and and brought him to the tribal leader that had come. And that baby was returned to the Sawi village where everyone also placed their hands on that baby. Now let me tell you, the missionary was really worried about those kids. What were they going to do to them? But he was concerned, he was concerned, but they assured him they would be fine. They would grow up in that village. They would be cared for. And he had no idea of this practice among the people. And you know what they called this child in their language? They called him the peace child. The Richardsons stayed many years and they shared the message of Jesus. And they said, God too has longed to make peace with humanity, and the only way that's been possible is for him to bring his child and to give his child to a family here on earth to be raised and to become a part of the people who are here, to make peace. 
But in the end, that baby laid in a manger was killed, this child God sent to bring peace. Yet even there, Jesus was bringing us home to the Father so that at a time like this at Christmas, we could know because God has done this and Christ has gone to the cross, we can have peace with God. We can have fellowship with a God who made us and loves us. This is what Joseph was told about Mary's pregnancy. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You see, this is how God has made peace. You know, God isn't angry with you. You know, God wants fellowship with you. Like that little girl reaching out her arms to me for me to hold her. And the way has been opened for us through this peace child, Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. I know there's so many things in us that we feel are barriers in our lives that would keep us from God, and, and Jesus has taken all of those things on himself, and that's really the message of Christmas. And so what will you do with Jesus? Will you receive him, and when you, will you find peace with God through him? Would you pray together with me? Father, thank you for the beauty of Christmas and the music tonight, Lord, is so powerful to teach us the truths of your great love. And Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love us so much that you sent your one and only son into our world so that anyone who believes in him uh, will not face, uh, be overcome by death, but will have life with you forever. And so Father, I pray that you would help us to see Jesus so that we might know your invitation to come into life together with you. And Lord, we thank you that you use the small things of the world. Remind us every day that your purpose is also to work through us, to share your grace and your love with those around us. And Father, thank you that you persist with us, that even tonight you're inviting us to come to you through Jesus. And we thank you and pray together in his name. Amen.